Hi, good morning. Good, morning. good to have all of you here. Good to have our visitors with us here this morning as well. Uh, old family friends, right? I guess. Okay, so we've got a number of connections going on here. That's good. That's good. It's awesome. Well, it's like a little taste of heaven, right? It's kind of what it'll be like, I imagine. We all start bumping into old familiar faces and friends that have gone before us. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, <clears throat> chapter number 14 this morning. We've been talking a little bit about discipleship, and kind of accidentally so. I uh, just kind of stumbled into that topic. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I've been fighting this little bit of a cough for a couple of weeks. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Jim and I got into a conversation, I think, last week, kind of around this particular text and uh, the importance of it for those who would be disciples of Christ. And it's certainly a familiar passage of Scripture. Um, but one of, the, one of the main things we know coming together into the house of God is important is to put ourselves in remembrance, right? putting ourselves in remembrance of things. And there's still a lot of things in this text for us to learn. So I'd like to... Just stand together, if you would, with me as we read just five or six verses here towards the end of the chapter. Luke chapter number 14. We're going to begin reading in verse number 25. It says, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and his mother, and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this morning just grateful for the opportunity, first of all, that you've given us the strength and the health to be able to gather together in your name, just praying and hoping according to your promise that you'll be here with us by your spirit and that you'll impart to our hearts the things that are needful for us this morning. Father, I pray that you would be with my mind and with my mouth, that I might speak only those things that are right and the things that which are useful to edifying, Lord, that you might be with the hearts of the people in their hearing that you might discuss and have a conversation with each one according to their personal need and the truth and the weight and the gravity of the words spoken by our Savior on this occasion, that they might sink down into our ears, Lord, that you might quicken our hearts to hear them and to receive them, and that we might be better off for having been here this morning, that we might be prepared more so for going out and preparing ourselves for the week ahead as many days as you see fit to give us, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So, how many of you are familiar with the idea of counting the cost? Right? You ever heard maybe a sermon or two on counting the cost? Counting the cost is not something that we are very good at in our particular culture and time of life. Um, you know, the whole idea of counting the cost, especially in this passage, has to do with giving something full consideration. Full consideration. And I wonder, just if you imagine with me for a few minutes, uh, how much better off would the world be if we each, before we took a specific course of action, gave it full consideration, right? How many, uh, how many marriages are entered into without full consideration? How many young people leave the home and wander out into the world, never really giving it full consideration? How many people exercise themselves in their role as being a parent or what have you never really gave it any full consideration? It's not a strength of our time and our culture and our people. It's really not something that we even teach very well to our young people. And we have a lot of young people in here this morning. If you consider yourself a young person, raise your hand. All right. So, yeah, we got a few people that are young people, a few people that think they're young people and we'll let them continue to think that too. I'm not going to burst that bubble. Who am, I to, who am I to say? In the scheme of eternity, we're all young people, right? I said we'll often think I th when we get to glory, we'll look back and think of this as spiritual kindergarten, right? Just, just all children of God, very young people. 
Well, the whole idea that you should give something full consideration is probably worth your time thinking about. Uh, it's one thing to be ambitious, to have ideas, to have notions, to have dreams, to have um, you know, desires to fulfill in life. And some of those things may be of the Lord, and we hope so. Even those require a full measure of consideration, right? A full measure of consideration. So not really something that we do very good at. And I think Jesus, knowing that, we notice from verse number 25, when he's speaking here, there's a great multitude of people. So in the, in the day and age in which Jesus walked the earth, uh, in the days of his flesh, the nation of Israel hadn't seen a real prophet in a long time. John the Baptist had come and he had been received as a prophet. And yet the Bible testifies that John never did any miracles. And so John pointed people to Christ. And now Jesus Christ has begun his ministry. And what has accompanied his ministry is miracles. That he's gone forth uh, and by the power of God he's healing and he's turning water to wine. Uh, he's curing people of diseases. He's casting out evil spirits. Uh, perhaps more importantly than all of those, he's feeding people for free. Uh, and everybody's loving that. And so there's a great multitude of people who are following him. And so Jesus Christ, who is the end from the beginning, and that's something we have to keep in mind as we understand the conversation that he's about to turn and have with this multitude, he's giving them the word of God. And the word of God is always sent into our hearts for our good. Amen. And he's, he's giving them something by which they can make examination of themselves and that they might be his disciples indeed. He often spoke to groups of people and talks about those who would be his disciples indeed. See, there's many people even in our time today who have made themselves the disciples of Christ in name or are following him for any number of reasons. And it was not different in his day. Great multitudes of people following Christ because maybe they were interested in what he would do next. Maybe they hoped to get something from him. Maybe they just enjoyed the thrill and the excitement of what was happening around them. And it was kind of the, the culture in the day to see, uh, let's go see what this man Jesus will do. And so they're following him. It's not different in our time. A lot of people have taken to themselves the name of Jesus as his disciple for many different and varied reasons. And so Jesus in his kindness and his goodness turns to address the people and he's going to uh, do what he always does. He's going to divide truth and error, right? Truth and error. And he's going to give them this opportunity and he, he speaks unto them in this way. Some pretty strong language as we know. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So Jesus Christ basically pulling out for uh, each of them the people in their lives that they counted the very dearest and the very sweetest and the most lovely whose company and companionship they enjoyed and prized above probably everyone else in their life. Each and every one of those, he calls them out all individually. All sweet and dear people to these people, I'm sure. But he, he takes the time to call them out and says very distinctly, if you don't hate these people, in other words, he's, he's contrasting what? The one who would be my disciple, the one who would follow me. Then what is, what is the requirement on the part of Christ? He's saying this is what it's going to cost. He goes on to talk about counting the cost. And he's using the parable to elaborate on what he had just taught them. So he's giving them a principle. He's setting forth a spiritual principle for them. And he's using all of these natural relationships. And we've talked about this before. How in Christ the spiritual things must and will and have to, by nature, supersede every natural relationship. The relationship we have in Christ by his spirit is, is above and preeminent in every way to every natural relationship that we enjoy. So while our uh, parents and our children and our spouses, all these individuals are dear to us, they cannot and must not be more dear to us than the Savior. Everybody in this room understands that, right? That's the principle he's setting forth, that we must love Christ 
supremely. Amen. Now, can anyone say, I love Christ supremely? Right? This is the ideal. He's setting forth what is a disciple, one who follows after. And so he's giving the, this crowd a word of caution and a word of admonition to say, look, sit down first and count the cost. It's great that you want to follow. And there's this other conversations we have in the Gospels where he's talking with people specifically about this whole idea of following and those who would go bury their father and those who would go say goodbye to their kinfolk and all these different things that were happening in real people's lives as they, as they tossed around this idea of being a follower. In Luke 3.17, we're told that the Lord, this was John the Baptist speaking of the Lord when he would come, speaks of the one whose fan is in his hand. And he will truly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. So when we think about the Lord and how thorough he is at kind of winnowing the chaff and the wheat and separating between what is real and what is not, those who are truly his disciples and those who are only following for what they can get from him or what they might enjoy about his company or uh, that it might afford them some status that they desire. Who knows all the different reasons that people may have. We know this, that the Lord Jesus Christ says he's the one who tries the hearts. So what's in view in, in this passage is a principle that teaches us that Jesus Christ tries the hearts of men. And he knows. And, and this is a, uh, this, this exercise this morning that I want to walk us through talking about uh, this aspect of discipleship. This is a, a journey. You know, the, the whole idea of a disciple is one who's following, right? And the teacher, as we talked about being a disciple of Christ, the one who knows all things, he's not going to run out of things to teach us. So he's always going to be teaching us and leading us along by degrees. So here he stops and he takes this time to teach. Now, I don't think and I almost say for certainty that even among his closest disciples that were with him and of all the company that were present at this time, I don't know if anyone in that moment had any idea what he's talking about. <laughs> I'd actually be more confident to say I'm almost sure that nobody even understood what he's saying. When he stopped and he turns to the crowd and he makes this statement, most of them probably kind of the, just that blank, blank, you know, like, okay. Like, I'll log that away and maybe I'll figure out where it fits later. And that's kind of how Christ works with us often in our lives, isn't it? That he's, he's teaching us and he's giving us things and we have um, testimony in Scripture that the apostles themselves, often hearing of these things, even when he told them uh, as they're going to Jerusalem, he's saying, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. He's going to be put to death. He's telling them exactly what's going to happen. And it says they understood none of these things. They didn't understand it. So it's easy for me to think that when he's telling them, if you don't hate all your relatives, you can't be my disciple. Now, Paul comes along later and he, he teaches and expounds on the principle, right? So we know this doesn't mean neglect of duty and abandon your homes and abandon your families. Uh, we see that the principle is expounded under Paul's teaching and the other apostles after the spirit came and they understood what's in view. What's, what's being taught here is a principle of discipleship. The question for us is, at what point are you not willing to follow? Because at whatever point you're not willing to follow is the point most likely where Satan has a place in your heart, a stronghold, if you will. The Bible warns us not to give place unto the devil. And whenever we have other things that could keep us from following, we may be very well tested on that front. And I think we can see from, from godly men's lives in Scripture that, that that plays itself out over time. Now, that, this doesn't mean at this one moment in time that the Lord is saying, you know, abandon everything and all your responsibilities, although there very well could have been men who had very little keeping them back who should have and would have been better off for doing that. 
But this principle that he's teaching them is followed by this idea in verse number 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, I'm sure by the time he says that, nobody has any idea what he's talking about. But they did know what a cross was. Because a cross was about the most cruel instrument of torture and death that anyone in the world of that time could conceive. It was intended to make a very public and open display of Rome's enemies. To basically say, if you stand against Caesar and you stand against Rome, then this is what you can expect. It was a method of intimidation that they would put to people to such a cruel and agonizing death that anyone else wouldn't dare do whatever that guy did, right? Namely, to stand against Rome. This became one of the sins, if you will, in Rome's eyes of Christians. Because while Christians did live peaceably, uh, and they sought to live peaceably, and they did good, one thing the Christians had that uh, aggravated Rome to a great degree was that they taught the worship of one God. James even said, you believe in one God, you do well. That's because they lived in a day when Rome had many gods, among which was whom? Caesar himself. And so to say there's one God and Caesar ain't it is to, in Rome's eyes, thumb your nose at Rome and for them to take offense. And so the cross was a very um, desirable means for them to put Christians to a public and open display to say this person denied the deity of Caesar and refused to worship Caesar as God. So while they might not have understood everything that's uh, at stake and everything that Christ is teaching in principle, he was giving them kind of a smack right between the eyes view of what was necessary to be willing to follow him. Count the cost. What aren't you willing to do? So to the extent of even going to a cross, that's what, that's what he puts it, the picture. And there's not anybody in this time that wouldn't have known what that picture was. And says, can I see myself there? And can I, can I see myself there because it's worth it to me to be a disciple of Christ? One thing that's important for these people uh, to understand is that Jesus Christ is the end from the beginning. And while it's easy for them to run with this multitude, it's not different in our time. It's easy to run as a Christian in the United States today with the multitudes of people who are running in his name. That's easy to do. Christ is warning them, it's not going to stay easy. He's the end from the beginning. In his mind, he already sees Calvary. He already sees how quickly... The crowds turn from Hosanna, Hosanna to crucify him, crucify him. He knows all of that. And he sees it already in his mind, the end from the beginning. And he's saying, it's easy right now. It's, it's a well-watered garden right now. It's easy to run in my name and to be with the crowds and enjoy the excitement and to gather with the enjoying all the benefits. But the question is, do you love the Savior or just love his benefits? Is he desirable to you or is what he can do for you what you're seeking? The journey of a disciple is coming to Christ to have those needs filled, but growing from there to see that it's not just what he does for me that's desirable. It's he himself that is the treasure. Amen. It's companionship with him. Amen. It's fellowship with him. And that inevitably... For every child of God at some point in your life will involve some degree of sorrow and pain. Should the Lord tarry? And, and that can come in a lot of different fashions. What kind of different fashions? Well, he tells us all the different arenas in which these trials can come. They can come in your children. They can come in your spouse. They can come in your home. They can come in a lot of different ways in your own life also, right? But the blessing comes to those who endure to the end. Those who endure to the end. It's easy to run with the crowds, but it may not always be that way. You know, I look at our nation and what's happening in the world today, and I think of Christians in this country who are, who are, are 
I think we are told in the millions. Some numbers of millions and millions of people in this country that are Christ followers. But I wonder how many of those are just running with the crowds because it's culturally the norm right now. But if that were to change and the one who's the end from the beginning says, you better count the cost. Can you see yourself? See, it's easy to serve the Lord when it's all just dreams and ideas and ambition. But when the rubber meets the road, how far can you go? And the danger is that we think, I can go. And the truth is, no, you can't. That is the danger. Our pride can even take its root in our following of Christ and say, yes. What did Peter say? I'll follow you even to death. And he meant it. In all sincerity, I believe Peter absolutely thought that he would do that. But what did he have to learn? That apart from the grace of God, giving us the power by his spirit to sustain us, we are just as likely to abandon Christ as anybody else. And that's sad, isn't it? Jesus Christ was no more unflappable in this moment when multitudes are following him than he was when everyone forsook him. He was doing the will of the Father. And he was living in perfect obedience. And he was living the life he came to live because he came to give a sacrifice to give us life. Right? He bore in himself the sins that we have committed. He bore all that in his own body. And and it's amazing to see, you know, you see really the frailty of men. Uh, There's very few men that could be surrounded and thronged by multitudes in this way who wouldn't be moved by that in some way right and and jesus actually you could almost look at it as it it almost gives the appearance of one who's trying to run off some of them (laughs) right And, and you don't see that with men with men as more people begin to follow the message gets watered down to get more to follow right we see kind of the other thing with men but with christ the truth is always the truth and he's always going to tell you the truth And so he looks to this crowd and he speaks to them almost in a way that you would think, well, I think he's trying to run away some of these followers. But that's not what he's doing. He's doing, out of an act of goodness towards them, a favor of love to warn them, to warn them to sit down and to count the cost. There's more to serving the Lord and following him than expecting his miracles, enjoying his healing, Uh, you know enjoying the teaching and enjoying all the the free food that he provided there's more to loving Christ than loving the benefits that he brings into our lives discipleship itself is a transaction it's we are transacted in this deal Paul says it this way that you're no longer your own you're bought with a price see we've been translated from the kingdom of Satan and the power of darkness which, by the way, operates by blinding men to the truth and deceiving them into thinking they're serving themselves. But as we saw a couple weeks ago, you're in the rank and file of the enemy. You're serving Satan and his purposes. The deception in your mind is, I'm serving myself. And that's a, the deception itself is a lie. It's a remarkable thing how he's able to deceive. And you know what frightens people more than anything sometimes when they're confronted with the gospel is the idea of this transaction, becoming the property of Christ's because they're scared of what he might ask of them. They don't realize where they're at now. They don't realize it. They think that they're free. And it's a deception. It's a remarkable, remarkable thing. And it continues to unfold through the generations on this earth. Paul says we're bought with a price. Jesus Christ paid that price. And if we are his, then he's the Lord. That's the, the meaning of the word Lord is master. Right? We could just as well use the word master and we come to Christ and we acknowledge the truth of what God has done because Peter says that it's God who has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. So when we come to Christ, we're simply acknowledging the truth of what God has already done 
And we're acknowledging that he is the master. Where does that place us then? Well, it places us at his feet. He's our teacher. He's our instructor. He's our master. He's our Lord. He is all things to us. He's our provider. He's our sustainer. I mean, it's in, in everything, you can look at that relationship in any context and in every a different dimension you might view it through. And you would say, this is a perfect description. So who else would you rather serve? I can't think of anyone else. I can't think of anyone else. Is it going to cost you something? Many people have sat down to that counting table and come away with bad math and said, it's not worth it. Right, they've sat down to the, the counting table and they've, and they've understood. They've understood what is involved in the transaction. Sometimes more so than people that have sat down to the counting table and said, I'll follow. Some people have sat down to the counting table with a better knowledge of what's involved and said, I can't follow. Because they did the math. And they said, the value that I place on what this life affords me is more than what Christ is offering me. It's more. The relationships of this life, the riches of this life, the pleasures of this life is more than what Christ is offering me. Does that make it true? No, but it's their perception. And as I say, perception is reality. It's how you view it. If that's the value you place on it, then the choices you make will follow. So a lot of people have sat down to this counting table and said, it's not worth it, right? So they've come away and said, no, I'm not going to follow. Different ages, and, and it's hard for us to sit down and really understand this, but different ages of men have all demanded different things of those who would be the followers of Christ, right? There have been followers of Christ who were diligent, faithful, uh, zealous, and earnest in every way. And circumstance just happened to be ordained such that their faith never required them to go suffer in a cell or be burned at the stake or die on a cross or any of the other things that we view as, you know, big things. Um, they were just diligent, faithful servants of the Lord, living a godly life, spreading the message of his gospel to anyone that would listen. And there's been a lot of those people live. Who gets to decide where the circumstances fall? Well, it's not us. Because if we got to choose, guess what we would choose? Say, I wanna, I'll want to. i sign up for that list, right? I'll sign up if I get to be on the list of people who live out in a prosperous uh, 21st century America, uh, and I get to just enjoy all the benefits of refined culture and society and taste all the finer things and not worry about food poisoning and you know, being eaten by wild animals or whatever other tortuous things life could throw my way. As long as I don't have to worry about being thrown in the Colosseum to fend for my life or anything like that. Yeah, I'll sign up. Do we get to choose that? Now, that's why Jesus said, count the cost to the end. What's it going to take to finish? Well, he said you should be prepared even to the going of a cross. In other words, in your mind, know I'm willing I don't, know, I don't know what the cost is going to be, but I'm willing. I've sat down. It's worth it. What Christ is offering is more than anything the devil could hinder me with or deter me with. There's nothing else that he could uh, deter me with in that way. Otherwise, it's hard for us to count the cost. I mean, a lot of people want to know, well, what's the cost going to be? I mean, what, if, can I get some idea? This is what you're saying as a disciple of Christ. That everything he's promised me, other than the presence of his spirit in my life, lies in the world to come. And whatever he does with me now in this life is his decision to make. See, we don't, have, we don't bring a lot, you might have noticed, to this deal. It's all his deal. He's the Savior. He's the Lord. He's the Master. And he paid the price. We're the slaves, right? We're the ones in captivity. We're the ones in the bondage of darkness. We're the ones dead in sins and trespasses. So while we like to come and negotiate our life with the Lord, the Lord says no. That's not how a disciple is going to live 
his life for Christ. The disciple is going to say, Lord, I'm yours. And whatever you bring my way and whatever you do in my life, I accept by faith and I accept it from your hand. It removes this whole idea. I mean, a lot of times we see everything, the bad stuff that happens in our life, that's the work of the devil. And the good stuff that happens in our life, uh, those are the blessings from God. What's true is that everything that happens in your life is ordained by Christ. He's Lord of all, the Bible says. So he's master over everything. And if he allows things into your life, we say what? Yes, Lord. I mean, this is the ideal. I get it. We all struggle through this. The ideal is that we bow the knee to Christ and we say, yes, Lord. And the Lord asks something of me and in his word, I bow the knee and I say, yes, Lord. Because ultimately our faith rests in his character, his word, his promises. What do we know of him? We know he loves us. We know he is good and he is merciful and he is kind. He's the best kind of Lord you can have. A Lord that is doing things on your behalf. He's not a self-serving God. He doesn't need to be. So we see there's a lot of uh, other roads that we could go down with that. But most of those roads to this point in our uh, discussion this morning have, are pretty well traveled, aren't they? I haven't said anything that is astonishingly new to you, right? These are all well-known things, but there's still things we need to be reminded of. I think this, um, it's good for us to be put in a mind every once in a while that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke these words to these people for their good to get them to a place. And like I said, I don't think they even understood it right here, but we know through the progression of time as they continued to learn that they grew in their faith and they grew in their knowledge and they grew in grace. And we see from the New Testament, you can study the book of Acts, that these principles became more real to them and they had a better understanding of how to live them in their life. And they became willing vessels, right? That sought to be used by the master. And that's the goal of a disciple, right? One who is prepared, as Paul says, unto every good work. In other words, the Lord is able to use you and to bring you into different situations. Uh, and, and he knows and that he's going to do through you his work. Ultimately, this is what we know to be true of God and his work. He's going to get it done. Do you believe that? I mean, I've heard sometimes preachers say, well, you know, God's work won't get done if you don't do it. I don't believe that. Amen. I believe God will get his work done. Amen. And it's not by us that he's going to get it done but this is the deal he offers us this tremendous opportunity to be involved and he's going to reward those who will willingly involve themselves and you will not go into eternity with any regrets for having yielded yourself to be involved the measure of glory in his kingdom and the measure of riches that he's promised to repay. And he is faithful. And Paul is always putting the churches in remembrance of this. For ye serve the Lord Christ. Right? It's of the Lord that you're going to receive the reward of the inheritance. He's always going back to that to remind us you don't, don't serve men, you serve the Lord. Because the Lord is the one who's going to give unto you according to your service. So ultimately, bringing all that back, God will get his work done. Right? This isn't necessarily, this isn't a guilt trip um, so much as it is an opportunity. You've believed the Lord Jesus Christ and we know what he's laid up in store. We spent some time talking about that. And now he's said, you can have a part in it. You can have a part in it. And that's, that's remarkable. It's remarkable that an all-powerful God would extend to men this opportunity to participate in his work and what he's doing. And so he's, he's doing a work in the earth to declare and preach the gospel, to reach the souls of men. And he says of his own work, not the least grain will fall to the earth. He's going to do it. 
Okay, not the least grain is going to fall to the earth. So God will do his work. He will save his people from their sins, just like he said. Amen. And he said to his followers, his disciples, if you will prepare yourself, I can even use you. And it, when and if I can use you, I will even reward you for your service in the life to come. That's, that's pretty phenomenal. So we've come to Christ. We've counted the cost. We've understood what his demands are, and he gets to be the Lord. But I want to flip this a little bit for just the last couple minutes. Because most of the time, this counting the cost exercise is viewed in this context. It's viewed, in, and this is the context that it's given. That if I want to follow Christ, that there's a price to be paid. And that I need to be willing in my heart to pay that price. Similar, you know, Abraham's a good picture of that, right? Sacrifice your son Isaac. He was willing in his heart to even sacrifice his only beloved son. Didn't hold anything back that God required. And then God said, okay, now I know. And then he received him, as it were, again from the dead. A lot of things there, but it's the same idea. We in our hearts must be willing and prepared to let anything go that he says has to go and to continue to be faithful in his service until he comes, right? That's what he's asked. But if you take the whole counting the cost idea, this is what I want to know. Most everyone in here that has counted, you've been through that exercise, right? Many of you have come to the place where you now ex have believed the truth of who Christ is and you're on that road of discipleship and you're learning and you're growing and being taught from the master. My question is, what about the other side of that coin? Because we always talk about counting the cost. What's it going to cost to follow? But there's a cost to not following. There's a terrible, terrible cost to not following. If you were to, if you were to gain all the glory, I mean, we, all the people in the world that we, uh, I say we, I use that term very generically, and the, all the people the world looks up to, right, that have all the glory and the praise and the wealth and, and all these magnificent things, and, and all the praise of men. And Jesus even told the Pharisees, you know, that they sought the praise of men. It's an easy thing to do to get caught into that idea of wanting men's affirmation, wanting men's praise, wanting people to think well of you. Even if you had all of that, right, and you, ha and you had just resounding millions of voices praising your name and thanking you for what a wonderful person you were uh, and all these things that you had accomplished, We've talked about this a little bit in the past couple of weeks, but when your whole life boils down and you stand before Christ, in that moment, you will finally know. You will finally know. And I don't think any of us can know this as deeply and as intimately as we need to know it. But you will finally know in that moment, there really was only ever one voice that mattered. Not, nobody else in that moment, nothing they have to say matters. And if you were to have all that praise and all the wealth and all the accolades that come with it, but you stand in that moment only to hear, depart from me. The weight of those words is going to weigh a lot heavier than all the praise. And if you were to ask yourself, was that worth it? Was that worth it? The, the trade, the cost of what was involved in pursuing everything that this life could afford my soul that ultimately proves itself to turn up empty, right? In the hour of judgment, in the hour and in the moment when you need something that matters most, that will all turn up empty. But all the saints of God who've lived their lives like Paul talks about, uh, living in caves and dens of the earth and being mistreated and uh, sawn asunder and chased and everything else, when they stand in that moment and they hear, well done. Nothing else is going to matter. It's all going to come down to that one moment of judgment. And everyone will know at that point in time, the cost wasn't worth it. The deceitfulness and the fleeting nature of the things of this life is not worth your soul. 
it feels like it in the moment. It looks appealing in, at the time. There's a lot of, lot of glamour and a lot of glaze to it and a lot of shine. It's all going to pass away. Amen. None of it is worth it. What Christ is here saying, I think, is that same idea. That supremely, a lot of us care what our wife thinks. And we should. But I can't live unto what my life, wife thinks. A lot of us care what our parents think, and we should. But I can't live unto what my parents think. A lot of us care what our children think. A lot of people don't serve God because they're serving their children. The ballparks are full of places on Sunday with parents serving their children and worshiping them in some instances you could make a case, scripturally speaking and spiritually speaking. None of that, you can't live unto that. They're important, and we should love them. But there's only one person that you can live unto, and it has to be Christ. Amen. has to be Christ. And I think that same idea is exactly what he's conveying to these people here. Like he said, you're not going to have Christ and all these other gods. Amen. You're not going to have Christ and all the other gods you want. You're going to have Christ and only Christ. That's it. And you worship him and him only shalt thou serve. It hadn't changed. If he be God, serve him. As the prophet Elijah said, how long will we halt between two opinions? Famously, Matthew 16, the Lord said, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Paul followed up the same idea in 1 Corinthians. The fashion of this world passeth away. It's all going away. Second Peter, Peter, the same thing. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Right? If we're going to count the cost, let's sit down and do some good counting. Right? Let's do some good counting. Do some good math. Sharpen the pencil. If you, if you come out settled in your heart and mind to serve Christ and only Christ, you will never be disappointed. Amen. The Bible says that those who believe in him will never be confounded or ashamed. Never be. Right? Count the cost. We, you may be at a place in your life where you feel like you're on pretty sure footing. And I praise God for that. But you're only ever just one phone call away from some tragedy in your life. Amen. Or something, in, or a piece of legislation, <laughs> maybe in our time today. We're only ever just on the precipice of a piece of legislation passing. Or something happening to radically alter what you expect your discipleship journey to look like. Christ has said, you better die to that Amen. and just decide to follow me. Amen. Whatever that looks like, at the end of the day and at the end of the road, when you stand before me, it will have been worth every mile, as the old song says. Right. It'll have been worth every mile. But if you're living kind of in this in-between where, well, I don't know, and the legislation said this, and now this is illegal, and now that's happened, and that... Guess where you'll be? You'll be blown about with every wind of doctrine. You'll be all over the map. You'll be no uh, clear, sure foundation in your life. And ultimately, when you stand before Christ, which is the only voice that matters, you'll not have an answer to give. So let's resolve in our hearts as disciples of Christ that, yes, I don't know what's coming, but I know the one who does, Amen. and he is good. And yes, that doesn't exempt me from sorrow it doesn't exempt me from suffering because this is a fallen sinful world and I've contributed to that I've been a part of that so I'm not exempt from those things Paul said even we also who have the adoption of sons grown together right we're travailing with the rest of creation as we all suffer through these things but we do it with hope right we do it with hope hope that is rooted in Christ brother